ferrou na sua mão. Quem sabe qual foi o Daniel? Guys, can I make a suggestion? Don't print notes off just two minutes before class, because when, what, 28 of you try to do that, it really jams up the printer, right? That makes sense. Try to do it well in advance. I mean, that's why I have everything posted for the entire year. If you're doing today's notes three minutes before class, it may not always work. So try to come ready. You guys good? All right, you guys all ready to go? All right, listen up, guys. Hey, guys, can we listen up, please? We'll get started now. Awesome. Okay. Um, on, ooh, when did we start school? Wednesday. I would have handed you guys a sheet of paper that said assessment policy on it. Any chance you guys still have that nearby? Somewhere. Somewhere. I'd like to find that because I want to talk about something we're going to do early next week. We're going to do a quiz. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Is that the one that we're Probably not. No, it literally says assessment policy at the top. That's the one. It looks like this. Well, if you have it, you have it. If not, then just listen really carefully. Oh, you can listen. Okay. Um, here's the plan for the next couple of days. Um, today we're going to do another set of notes. We're going to talk about, about the periodic table, which I think you guys have some experience with in grade 9, correct? Okay. And then Monday I'm going to... No, Monday you're not going to come, because I'm not going to come either, because Monday is Labor Day, so don't come Monday. Tuesday I'm going to give you guys a work day. Okay, good question. So when I give you guys work days, I don't plan structured activities. I'm a big believer that I need to give you guys time in class to study. And that's basically what Tuesday is for. Tuesday will be a study day, so you guys can get ready for the quiz we're going to have on Wednesday. Okay. Now, when it comes to work days, I'm a firm believer that if you're not actually going to come to class and do something productive, go elsewhere. I'm dead serious on that. And that's why I want you to have those forms signed, because honestly, if you're just not going to study and you're going to cause a commotion and make it hard for everybody else, I'm going to politely ask you to go home. Okay. I'm not really the kind of teacher who's going to yell at you, but I'm going to strongly suggest if you're coming on Tuesday, you need to come with the intention in mind that you're going to want to study. You're going to want to do something purposeful to help you learn. Okay. And the big advantage to me giving you class time for studying, a full class, 90 minutes, as opposed to saying you got to study at home, is that I'm here. Okay. I'm sure you've probably all experienced this before where you go home and study, but like, you don't really know what you're doing, and it would sure help if you could ask some questions, right? That's why I want to give you in class time for that, so that you can ask me, hey, I don't understand this. Can you go over this with me? Okay. It's another reason why I videotape my lessons, so that you can rewatch the lessons at home if you want, but then you can spend that class time talking to me. Does that make sense? I tell my high school, you guys are high school now, I tell my grade 11 and 12 kids this all the time. If you knew how to do all of this chemistry and math stuff that we're going to end up getting to, if you know how to do this already, I wouldn't have a job. Right? And I mean, it's only going to get harder from here. So I really want to encourage, and I'm a big believer this as a teacher, I need you guys to learn how to learn. I need you guys to figure out the work habits and the, eth the effort skills that you're going to need 
so that once we get past science 10 and I teach you chemistry and physics and calculus one day, that you have those skills that you need. Does that make sense? So long story short, I need you guys to be ready for a work day. And that doesn't mean that you can goop around all day, but actually it does though. I'm not going to stop you. If you want to be on your phone all class, I'm not going to take it away. I'll probably point out, hey, you should probably study. Does that make sense though? Yeah. Okay. For the assessment policy, I want you to know a bit about how my quizzes work. Um, I do things a little bit differently than you maybe are used to. Um, your test on Wednesday is going to be consisting of either multiple choice questions or numerical response questions, which is kind of like uh, just you're at, giving me a number. Okay. If it's a numerical response question, you have to have it all the way right to get the answer correct. However, multiple choice is a little more complicated, and so I actually wrote down on this assessment policy how multiple choice is going to look. So hopefully you can find this section here. There's some good parts to it that I think you're going to like, and there's some bad parts to it that I think you're not going to like. So we'll see how this looks. There's five ways you can answer a multiple choice question. That may sound weird. It's like, how is there five ways? But here are the possibilities. Let's say that it's A, B, C, D, and you choose A. And let's say the answer is A. You get a mark, like you always have. Does that make sense? However, let's say it's A, B, C, D, and you choose A, but the answer is B. I'm going to take off a quarter of a mark. So you're actually going to lose a partial mark if you get it wrong. Okay. Now, that sounds mean, but there's a couple of rationales for this. Okay. One of the things it does is it discourages just blind guessing. Okay. As assessment, I need to know what you actually know, not what you're randomly guessing on. Does that make sense? That's what assessment's supposed to be. It's supposed to prove what you know. So you kind of have a bit of a choice here. If you think you know the answer, but you don't, you kind of have to hedge your bets because... I mean, for example, if you were in my wife's position, she's a nurse, and she works people giving. She works in the delivery ward where, where like the, the the babies are born. Does that make sense? You can't guess. You need to know. Does that make sense? Because people's lives are at risk. And granted, you guys are in grade ten now. Obviously, we're not there yet. But I do want to encourage the fact that an assessment really should test what you actually truly 100% know, not what you guessed on. So the reason why it's a quarter point deduction is let's say there were four questions that you didn't know, and you guessed on all four of them. Probably you'd get one right. Does that make sense? But do you deserve to get that one right if you were just guessing? No, it's not something you truly knew. It's something you guessed. So therefore, as a way to counteract the fact that you were guessing, every wrong question kind of loses a partial mark. Does that make sense? Okay. So then the third possibility is maybe you don't know, and you don't want to risk losing a partial mark. So then you don't answer it at all. No, you just get nothing for that question. However, it doesn't just end there. This is the part you guys might like. Sometimes you maybe have had a multiple choice question before where you've narrowed it down to A and B. You just, you're not sure. You're like, I know it's not C, I know it's not D, but I know it's A or B. Anyone ever been in that situation before where you're like, oh, I need to flip a coin or something like that? You know, maybe you don't, but like you're eeny, meeny, money mowing the thing. Right. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let you select possibly two answers. So for example, you could select A and B and circle both answers on your multiple choice test. And if the answer was A, I'll give you half a mark, which I think seems fair because you knew how to narrow it down to half the question. Does that make sense? There's the downside to that. I think most people like that idea. They're like, ooh, I can get a half mark for knowing the halfway point, right? If you guess two answers and you still get it wrong, so for example, if you circle A and B, and it wasn't A or B, it was actually D. I'm gonna take off a full mark. Meaning that like, you were so wrong, I let you guess two answers, you totally don't know what you're doing, I have to take off a full mark for that. Because that's not just like a, I don't know what I'm doing, that's a, I made a horrible bad mistake. Again, I feel like an analogy to my wife's work, like as a nurse, she has to choose between two medications to give our patient. And she doesn't give like a better one than the other one. She gives a totally wrong medication and something goes horribly wrong. Does that make sense? I gotta take off a full one. So it's gonna try to change the way you're used to doing a test. So five possibilities. I'll walk one more time. You pick A, the answer is A, you get a mark. You pick A, the answer is B, you lose a quarter mark. You don't guess at all. Nothing happens. You select A and B, 
and one of those two happens to be the right answer, you get half a mark. You select A and B, but the answer was, say, like C or D, you lose a mark. Like I'll subtract a full mark. Does that make sense? So my emphasis here is not on just being able to have good test writing skills. I really need to know what do you know. So it kind of changes the way guessing works a lot on multiple trips. So now here's the bright side. I've mentioned this before. I'm also a big believer that you need to be able to learn from your mistakes. So if this first quiz goes horribly, horribly wrong, you would not be the first person that has that happen. The key then is how do you learn? How do you get better? Does that make sense? So that's what these progress logs are for. So if you guys have your progress log, I'm going to see those. What's going to happen after you guys mark your test? And by the way, you guys are going to mark your own tests. What I like to do is I like to make an answer key and put it up on the front table here. I'm actually going to have you guys mark your tests. Okay. Once you're done, quiz number one in this row right here, I'm going to ask you guys to put down the day we did it. So I'll be on Wednesday. Uh, late doesn't really apply to a quiz, because, but, but it will to like assignments and labs. And then I want you to record your mark and your percentage. Here's the important thing. that I could care really less about the first couple columns. What I really care about is that long column there that says improvements. Because how do you learn? You make mistakes, and you work on fixing them. Does that make sense? That, that's how learning happens. And I could care less about how your chemistry works, or your physics, or your math. The most important skill I want you guys to have, once I'm done teaching you, is I want you to know how to learn. Because I think I've said this to your guys' class, and North helped to my other high school classes. Are you ever going to walk down the street and someone's going to ask you to solve a math problem? It's not really how life works. But it's the, it's the thinking skills, the problem-solving skills, that's what I need you guys to help develop. And we do that through math and chemistry and science. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. So I'm giving you guys some warning about next week. It's going to happen fast, because like it's going to be long weekend, study day, quiz. That makes sense. So make sure you're not like all of a sudden like, oh, we have a quiz. No. I warned you. Sound good? Oh yeah, let's do a set of notes. I'm going to talk a bit about the periodic table. So you guys probably have used the periodic table in grade 9, am I right? Yeah. Okay, so hopefully you know a little bit about it. What I would recommend is on that formula fold-out sheet that I gave you guys, you can write anything you want. And I mean anything you want. So sometimes, pardon me, I might give you guys some ideas about things you might want to write down there in case you forget. But basically it's, it's your cheat sheet. Anything you'd like. So we're going to talk about how the periodic table works, starting with... Did I steal yours? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, starting with uh, just kind of like the general idea as to how the periodic table is set up. Does anybody recall the name of the scientist that like helped develop the periodic table? Hey, Mendeleev, yeah, Mendeleev, Russian scientist. Basically, what was that? Dmitry, yeah, I think that was his first name. I think he was Russian. He basically came up with the idea of let's start grouping similar things together. And so one of the things we do with all of the elements here is we divide them based on three categories. And I've got them in color here. Everything on this side of the table over here is usually considered to be what's called a non-metal. Everything that's over on this side over here is called a metal. And then there's a few things that are kind of right in the middle of what's called the staircase line. You guys ever heard about the staircase? It's called the metalloids. And those are like the three broad categories of, of compounds. Now, the first thing I need to do is point out one common misperception kids have. Metal does not mean solid. I think a lot of students, they think metal means solid. Like, solid as like a state of matter, but that's not true. Okay. I'm going to show you some exceptions. You guys see the colored periodic table over here? Almost everything on this side of the periodic table over here is black. So, blacks are solids. And all of these things are metals. But is every single one of those things actually solid? Two exceptions, two main ones. Right here is mercury. Mercury is a liquid. Um, now, you guys don't have a color periodic table, so you might just want to like indicate on there, just remember that mercury is liquid. I don't know whether the color is really that distinct. I guess it's kind of a little bit of a shade there, isn't it? It's not bad. And then the other main exception is way over here. Uh, hydrogen is on the metal side of the table. 
And, uh, yeah, hydrogen is kind of tricky. Technically, hydrogen is on that side of the table, but it actually, if you look at this guy right here, it's actually considered a non-metal still, though. <laughs> so although we put it kind of over there, it's actually one of the non-metals. Then you might think, well, all of these non-metals, they should probably not be solid, but that's actually not true either. Like carbon and phosphorus and sulfur and selenium and iodide, all of these guys right here are considered to be non-metals. But yet they're solid. Does that make sense? So the first misconception I need you to know is that the state of matter is not the same thing as metal versus non-metal. Okay. Um, do you guys know what the difference between synthetic and natural is? You guys used those words before? Sure, man-made. Or like discovered in nature would be natural. Maybe not man-made because we, I mean, although there are some chemicals that we can synthesize in a lab, uh, like anyone watch Iron Man 2 where he just like makes a new chemical, like yeah, mostly like a synthetic chemical might be, might be the product of a, uh, like a nuclear decay. And what happens is it's very unstable. It might only last for a couple of minutes and then it's going to change into something else. So there is a way on your periodic table then of telling which ones are natural and which ones are synthetic. The best way of doing it is to look at the molar mass number. You guys know how there's like a number up in the corner that has like a 69.723? If you guys look at your tables, like uh, oxygen is 16.00. Okay. There are some, you can find technium, which is uh, number 43. If you can find its molar mass number, you see how it's in brackets? Yeah. That's a synthetic one. The ones that have those molar mass numbers that don't go to two decimal places, and it's just like a whole number, that's a synthetic one. And the reason why is that, remember how yesterday we talked about how Dalton had the idea that uh, all elements of each type had to have the same mass? It was wrong because of neutrons. You could have five neutrons or six neutrons or seven neutrons. Those decimal numbers that are in your data booklets are based on like averages, whereas like each individual atom either way is 94, or it weighs 95, or it weighs 96, does that make sense? Anyways, the synthetic ones, they're always whole numbers in brackets because they're not found in nature. And because they're not found in nature and they're synthetic, it either has to be one or the other, and it can't be some sort of rounded average. Does that make sense? So some good examples would be ketchnium. A lot of the ones on the bottom, the, the ones in this one here, are often um, like a white. Usually those ones are the ones that we're going to call the, the synthetic ones. That makes sense? Cool. All right, moving on. Um, some properties of metals I need you guys to know. Um, they're all on the left hand side of the table. Here are some properties. Maybe you want to write them down, unless you can memorize them or just recognize them. Typically, the metals are fairly strong. We make things out of these metals, like iron and nickel and cobalt. Now, we want to use them to produce useful tools and machines and stuff. I would say that when I talk to my classes, people usually know almost all of these words. They know what strong means, the hard, conduct electricity, but most people don't know these two words right here, I would say. Anybody know what they are? Anybody know malleability and ductility? So I would define malleability as this. Malleability can be like, um, uh, it can usually be bent into a sheet. of metal. Like when I think of malleability, metal, I think of how you can like have like a big sheet of aluminum. Does that make sense? Can I have a big sheet of oxygen that I can make a, like wrap around the body of a car or make like a tin can? So that's why tin is a metal. I can bend it into a sheet of metal, but oxygen I can't. Uh, do you guys know what ductility refers to? Uh, usually when we refer to ductility, we talk about the ability to pull it into wires. And so you can actually like bend it and it's kind of stretchy. Like when I think of this, I think of like a guitar string. You guys know how you can like pull a, gar a guitar string nice and tight? Does that make sense? Like you twist the thing there? That, that, that's a ductility property, the ability to make a wire out of it. Again, not everything can do that, right? Can you make a wire out of carbon? No, actually, uh, carbon would probably turn into a dust. It's just not quite that strong to be able to manage that. 
Like carbon would be like uh, ashes that you find in your fireplace. Or uh, actually, we use carbon in our uh, pencils for lead. Uh, graphite is uh, carbon. Right? Could you make a wire out of your uh, pencil lead? No, nah, it's way way too brittle. That makes sense. So, um, other than that, you guys probably know all the rest of those terms. Uh, Non-metals basically are the opposite then. So non-metals cannot be made into sheets of metal. They can't be turned into wire. Okay. Uh, the metalloids then are kind of the in between ones. Like we're not really sure whether they're one or the other. They sometimes have maybe one is strong, but it can't be turned into wire. So these guys are the exceptions. Um, I might put like a little star on your data booklet somewhere just so you know which ones are which. They're basically all of the ones along the staircase. Like up here, you've got boron, then silicon, germanium arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium and acetate. So I might just put a little star next to them just so that you know which ones officially are the metalloids. But with the exception of this guy right here, who is aluminum, pretty much anybody who touches the staircase is a metalloid. Aluminum does not. So basically, if it touches the staircase line, it's a metalloid, except aluminum. Probably makes sense, though. I mean, if you know much about aluminum, we use it for like cans and stuff. It, it's, a, it's a metal. Okay. Uh, there's another way that we categorize our periodic table. Maybe you know these terms. They're known as groups, and uh, on the next slide, it's periods. And basically, it refers to how it's like a grid. It's like the up and down versus the side to side. Sense. So groups go up and down, and these things often share very similar uh, properties. For example, everybody in this last group right here, they are all gases. It's a very unique property, and that's why Mendeleev ended up putting all of these guys together. Uh, this group over here is also very similar. They're known because they're very reactive with water. Um, when we get higher up in chemistry, I'll show you that if we put sodium in water, it will actually explode. Actually, pretty cool to YouTube if you can find uh, YouTube videos of potassium and rubidium. I've seen one before where they, they threw some rubidium in a bathtub and like it shattered the bathtub. Really cool. so. Anyways, for these groups, there's four groups that you guys should know the names of because we've given them formal names. These guys are known as the alkalis. These guys are the alkaline earths. And then everything in the middle doesn't really have a name until you get to the very end again. The second last group is known as the halogens, and the very last group is known as the noble gases. So I might recommend just write that down there if you don't know that already. So up and down is a group. Side by side is known as a period. And periods don't really share similar properties all that well. There are only seven periods in a periodic table, though, which sometimes confuses kids. Um, now, I'm going to stand over here again. So a lot of people, they think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rows in the table. But well, that's actually not how the table works. In order to save space, if you look at the numbering system, see how it goes 56 and jumps to 72? Yeah, what they did is they kind of like took all of this stuff and jumped it down there. Because otherwise the table would have been really, 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 really long. Does that make sense? So this was a space-saving idea. Is it really goes 55, 56, 57, blah, 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 and then it keeps going. So there's actually not nine periods. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with these guys actually slotting in there. Do you guys know that before? Yep. Awesome. Is this kind of a review, by the way? Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about atoms. Um, we mentioned yesterday the idea of how scientists are trying to figure out, well, what is stuff made out of? Uh, Democritus was the guy who we usually credit with terming the term atom. If you guys recall, atom refers to the term like indivisible is like the Greek for it. Well, we've since learned that really atoms are divisible. There are smaller things than, say, carbon. Carbon is actually made up of tinier things. And those three things are protons, neutrons, and electrons. And uh, maybe one day we'll even figure out what those are made of. Actually, there are theories, by the way. Um, you guys, 
some of you watch Big Bang Theory? Um, there's been some episodes where they talk about, um, there's one episode actually where Leonard and Penny, well, Leonard wanted to take Penny to Switzerland to go visit the Bern, uh, the, the, the CERN super collider. You guys ever heard about the super collider thing? Um, if you haven't, here's basically the idea. They spent millions upon millions of dollars deep underneath the mountains in Switzerland so that hopefully there is going to be no interference from like, you know, anything else, deep buried underground. And they built a really long track. So, like, imagine just an oval, basically, shape, right? And what they want to do is they were going to take two particles and send them in opposite directions, speeding them up, and then hopefully have them crash into each other at basically the speed of light. And what they're hoping to do is take the smallest atoms they can, like protons and electrons, crash them into each other, and make them break apart. And then hopefully they could figure out what electrons are made of. Does that make sense? So really cool ideas. Um, there's actually a, some pretty big breakthroughs recently where they managed to find something called a Higgs boson particle. Not that you guys need to know this, but they ended up finding something they were looking for, and so we started to seem to have some theories about actually what electrons or protons are made of. But that probably won't get, I mean, maybe by the end of my lifetime or your lifetime, maybe they'll actually be starting to teach that in school. But that's what they're working on is, let's try to break a proton in half. So anyways. I get distracted sometimes. I like telling stories. Um, atoms have a nucleus. Um, so here's the nucleus, and then the electrons are around the nucleus. Are they actually going around in circles? No. No, that was like Rutherford's idea. I mean, it's kind of close, but technically electrons, as soon as you try to find an electron, it's fucking gone anyways. So we don't usually think of atoms like this, but we often draw them like this still. Um... You guys know this already. Neutrons are neutral, electrons are negative, protons are positive. Have you guys ever heard about how electrons fit in different energy levels? Okay, good. So the basic idea is, and this, this was actually confirmed by Niels Bohr, which is one of the reasons why I think Bohr is actually really influential. I mentioned yesterday, it can either exist in energy level 1, or it can exist in energy level 2, and it can even jump from 1 to 2 but it's never found like between one and two. That was that like teleportation idea. So the basic idea is usually the first level holds two electrons, then it's eight, then it's eight, then it's 18. There's actually a reason for that pattern. Two, the top row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the second row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the third row. And then the next row, one, through 18. So that's actually where kind of a pattern comes from as to how many electrons, uh, a level of electrons can hold. And that's the reason why the, the periods are arranged as such. So there's actually seven different places you could find electrons. And we often still draw them with rings like this. So uh, let's do an activity then. Let's try to draw a ring for, uh, for an element and see if you guys have maybe done this before. Let's do silicon. So first thing about silicon, what number on the table is silicon? Perfect. Okay. So what that means is that it has to have 14 protons. I guarantee it. Can silicon have 15 protons? What if silicon is like a positive charge? It doesn't matter. If it has 15 protons, it's not positive. Okay. Uh, do we know how many neutrons silicon has? It could. It could have 15, or it could have 16, or it could have 17. And that's why that Dalton model of the atoms atom is not true. Okay. Now... You know how silicon has a number next to it, like 28.0 something? I mean, if it has a number around 28, it probably has 14 neutrons. It has like 14 are protons and 14 are neutrons, but it could have 15. Does that make sense? So we don't actually know exactly how many pro uh, neutrons it has. But I can tell you how many electrons it should have as well. It should have 14 electrons. And the reason why is that in an atom, your protons and your electrons should be the same. You guys know this? Awesome. Okay. So then if we want to draw kind of a diagram here, it might look something like this. Uh, there's 14 protons. I'm just going to say there's 14 neutrons. But is everybody clear, though, that I don't actually know that for sure? No, there could be 15. Eh, well, let's try Let's write 15 anyways. So then we sometimes draw them in orbit. I know they don't orbit, but we sometimes draw them like this. So in the first orbit, how many electrons are there? Two. Two. Perfect. One for the hydrogen, one for the helium. So I might draw it like one. Two. Uh, we often draw them in pairs. Then the next energy level. Eight. Yeah, eight. So we often still draw them in groups of two. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many have I used now? I've used uh, 10, right? But I had 14, so 14 minus 10, how many are left? Perfect, four, yeah. So the third energy level will have uh, one, two, three, four. That makes sense? Okay, so a couple of terminology things here then. If I were to talk to you about energy levels, how many energy levels does um, silicon use up? I would say it, it uses up three. The first level is full. Uh, the second level is full. Uh, the third level is not full, but it's being used. Does that make sense? And I mean, you can know that then because what period is silicon in? It's in period number one, two, three. Mr. Cleaver, can you please go to your office? Mr. Cleaver, please go to your office. Okay. There is a term, though, that we use to describe the very, very outside electrons. It's called valence electrons. Is that a term you guys know? Okay, good. I finally found where I think you guys haven't learned something before. I'm kind of searching if you guys can't tell. i got to figure out what you've already learned. So there's a term called valence electrons, and I'm sure I have it somewhere. Fantastic. Next slide, Ian. Valence electrons are known as the electrons in the last energy level. And it's very important for us to count those valence electrons and see how many there are. Okay. Uh, it's actually a big principle behind how matter sticks together. So in that silicon example we just had here, how many valence electrons would you say there are? Four, yeah. There's the one, two, three, four. If I go back to these guys right here, how many valence electrons does oxygen have? One, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, magnesium just has two. Exactly. Based on those valence electrons, that's actually how things are able to stick together. Really what happens is if I have six valence electrons and somebody else has two valence electrons, our electrons kind of like merge together. And that's how compounds form. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, Okay, I'm going to write something down here. I want to talk about two words, atoms and ions. Because I have, I have the term ion right here. I want to describe them first. An atom refers to something that is neutral. For example, if we want to talk about, uh, let's pick something simple. Let's talk about carbon. No, let's not do carbon. I take it back. Let's talk about lithium. Uh, how many protons does lithium have to have? Three, yeah, because it's number three. Uh, I don't know how many neutrons it has, but maybe it has one or two. Okay, let's not focus on that. If it is an atom, lithium must have three electrons. Okay. But here's what lithium would look like with three electrons. Lithium would have its first energy level with two electrons. And then it would have a second energy level with just one electron out there. And that one electron is kind of lonely. It doesn't have any buddies. Does that make sense? So he might want to go find somewhere else to be. And so often what happens is atoms turn into ions. Ions are charged. And so what can happen is sometimes these electrons, you can either get more of them or you can lose them. And what lithium will try to do is lithium might try to get rid of that extra electron and say, no, I don't need it. I've got a full valence level right here. Fantastic. And right here, I've got just this extra electron kicking around. It might try to get rid of that electron. And what's going to happen then is now lithium will still have three protons, but it now will only have two electrons because it ditched an electron. Now it's no longer neutral. Why? Well, there's three pluses, but only two minuses. Does that make sense? So lithium is often known as having a charge, and we write charges up in the top corner of plus one. And you guys can actually see that on the periodic table there. Up in the top, uh, what is it going to be, right-hand corner, there'll be a plus one next to lithium. Does that make sense? Let's try another example then. Uh, beryllium is right next to it, B-E. Beryllium is going to have four protons, and if it's an atom, it'll have four electrons. So there'll be two electrons in the first energy level, 
and then it'll have two electrons in the second energy level. How many electrons makes the second energy level full? Eight. Boy, that's a lot of electrons to find. Like if you're beryllium, you have two options. You can either try to find six buddies, or you could say, let's just get rid of those two electrons that are there and ditch them. Does that make sense? So if you had to try to find six more friends, or kick out two, it's probably easier to kick out two. That's a bad analogy. But does that make sense? So what beryllium typically likes to do is say, I'm just going to try to get rid of these electrons. So then beryllium typically will have a charge of plus two because it'll have four protons, but it'll bump down to only two electrons. And it's because of these plus and minus charges things have, that's how matter sticks together and forms compounds. Does this make sense so far? Okay, let me do one more example then so that it solidifies it. Let's talk about fluorine, F. Fluorine. Ethan Greer, can you please come to the office for checkout? Ethan G. Greer, please come to the office for checkout. Fluorine should have nine protons, because it's number nine. Yeah, is that right? As an atom, fluorine will then have nine electrons. Nine's not a good number, though. If I start drawing out the energy levels for fluorine, it looks like this. Two electrons in the first energy level, so that's full, fantastic. Second energy level, a full energy level has eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would love to pick up that eight electron, but it doesn't have eight electrons. It only has seven. Does that make sense? Because it adds up to nine here, the two plus the seven. So what ends up happening here is fluorine would really like to gain an electron because if it can find an extra electron to just add into the mix here, now it would have a full energy level. Where might fluorine find extra electrons? Well, you know how sodium and beryllium wanted to get rid of them? Well, it'll take those electrons. And that's actually how you form compounds. Often what happens in compounds is something on this side of the table over here would like to get rid of its extra electron. And something on this side of the table over here would love to find an extra electron. So the most common compound you guys probably know is sodium chloride, that's salt. You guys know that? Sodium has one extra electron, and chlorine actually would love to have an electron. And that's actually what makes salt such a stable compound. So what will happen then is fluorine will try to pick up an extra electron, become 10 electrons. And so as an ion, we would call it F minus. Maybe minus one. We, might write, we, we sometimes skip the one. But. Does that make sense at all? Yep. Is this something you guys have learned before? Or is this new information? New information? Or are you bored? Okay. So um, we're getting to that fuzzy area where we're new. Okay. Um, here's some diagrams then of valence electron shells. Okay. And what you might discover here is everybody in this row right here. See how everybody here has like one extra electron? Everybody in this column here would love to get rid of its electron. So almost everything here has a charge of plus one. Right here, these guys have two extra electrons. So they often have charges of plus two. And so on and so on. Often we have to kind of skip the middle of the table to make this work. I'm going to go over to this group right here, number 17. See how number 17 has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons? It's really, it's missing an electron, and it would love to get one more. So almost everything in this group actually has a charge of minus one. Now, it's a little frustrating. Your data booklets, they don't actually write the charges next to fluorine and chlorine. So if you'd like to, feel free to write them in. Uh, fluorine and chlorine are minus one charges. And basically everything below it as well, like bromine, iodide, they're all negative ones. So underneath chlorine is uh, bromine. It's also a minus one. Underneath bromine is iodide. It's also a minus one. Anyone want to hazard a guess on what happens in the oxygen sulfur column? It's minus two, yeah. Because really, this oxygen would love to find an electron to go here and here. So almost everything in this column down here is, in general, a minus two and minus three, and so on. OK, one more thing then. This last column right here is very unique. They were actually given a special name historically. They were called the noble gases. Um, 
you guys ever talk about like ancient times and like the nobles? Nobles did not like to associate with peasants. You guys heard this before? Oh, like they were, they lived in their castles and hid away from all the Rolex out there. And that's actually where these guys were named for. Because helium and neon and argon, they don't react with anything else. The reason being is that they have full valence electrons. Helium has two electrons. It doesn't want to gain or lose any. Uh, neon has its two plus its eight. Again, it has no reason to want to react. And so everybody in the last category was known as a noble gas, or sometimes we call it inert. Uh, inert basically means unreactive. The things in the final column, they are never found, almost never, there are some exceptions, but basically they're never found in compounds because they have no reason to react. They don't need to gain or lose electrons. Does that make sense? Cool, all right, we're almost done. So what I need for you guys to be able to do then as a task, and I'm gonna give you a worksheet to work on in a bit, is differentiate between atoms and ions, okay? Atoms are neutral. So when you write me an atom, there should not ever be a little charge in the corner because atoms have not gained or lost electrons yet. But ions, ions are no longer neutral because either they've gained electrons or lost electrons. If you gain more electrons, you become negative. If you lose electrons, you actually become positive. And when you form these ions, there's basically two possibilities then. If you become positively charged, we call you a cation. And if you become negatively charged, you become an anion. Cation for positive, anion for negative. Um, a really smart student years ago came up with a clever idea for how to remember that. And I always got to give him credit. It was Cody Van Driesen, if you know who he is. And he told me that to remember this, cats have paws. So therefore, cations are positive. I said it one more time. I thought it was brilliant. What was that? So, so cats have paws. So therefore, cations are positive. Anions then are negative. And what I'm going to talk about next week is how, you see how sodium right here is a positive because it's lost an electron? You see how chlorine sometimes has a negative on it? What do positives and negatives like to do? Well, kind of like magnets, positives and negatives will attract each other. And that's what makes NaCl, which makes salt. So our goal of next week is to start learning how to name compounds. So here's what I'm going to ask you guys to work on. I'm going to give you guys a worksheet for the last few minutes, and then we'll practice this on Tuesday. If I were to give you something like, say, well, let's do magnesium 2+. Plus. I might ask you to tell me things like, how many protons does it have? How many electrons does it have? Maybe we'll make a chart out of it. How many protons does magnesium have to have? Why? Was well, number 12, yeah. Its atomic number is 12, so magnesium has 12 protons. Now, if it was a magnesium atom, it would also have 12 electrons. But it's not. It's got a 2 plus. So the only way to make it 2 plus is that it only has 10 electrons. It's lost two of its electrons, giving them away because it doesn't want them. Whereas if I wrote Mg just by itself, and I didn't write a charge in the quarter, it's now an atom. Good. Okay. It would still be 12 because it's still magnesium. Rather than being 12 and 10, it would be 12 and 12. Sometimes we might throw some other things in then too. And I might throw in, like, say, the neutrons column. Or I might even talk about what it's like, uh, what its mass is. So, for example, if I told you that we were talking about calcium 41 with a 2 plus, oh, that's a 2, by the way. Sorry, that's ugly. 2 plus. If I told you it was calcium 41 with a 2 plus. Right. So first, how many protons does calcium have to have? Because it's number 20. That makes sense. If it's going to be a 2 plus, it can't have the same number of protons and electrons. It's an ion. So it has to have more protons if it's positive. Perfect. It's it. Right. So then we can also do what we talked about yesterday and throw in neutrons. If the 41 right here refers to its mass, how many neutrons does it have then? Perfect because the 20 protons and the 21 neutrons add to give it 41. 
does calcium have to have 21 neutrons though? It could have 22 or 23 or 20. We don't actually know. Each individual atom has one or the other. Those rounded two decimal numbers you get, like 40.08, are just an average of how many it has. Do one more. We'll call it uh, sometimes we write the notation a little bit differently. Sometimes we write it as like, uh, let's do one here. F E, we'll do 2 plus. And then, which one do we write it again? Uh, let's go with like 56 and 26. Did you guys get this notation on a worksheet I gave you yesterday? Okay, it might, been, it might have been in our notes too at one point. What this notation here means is the top number is how heavy it is, and the bottom number is the number of protons. So, I mean, iron is 26. I knew that by looking at the table. And that 56 up there is its mass. So then how many neutrons? 30, yeah. Because 26 and 30 makes 56. And the second question is, is this an atom or an ion? And we know that because of the charge. So then all we've got to do is then figure out, do we need more or less electrons? And we'd like, we'd like a few less, so we only want 24. If it was something with like a negative charge in the corner, then the electron number better be higher than the proton number. Can things gain or lose protons? Give me one sec. Sorry, I know you have that. Oh, then just go. Huh. Let me test my shit. Um, can things gain or lose protons? The answer is no. Um, protons are bound very tightly in the nucleus, and they're not able to escape, basically. But the electrons surround the nucleus, and so therefore we can change electrons, but we can't change protons. And if we did change protons, it would be something different, because if we added protons to iron, it would become like cobalt. Does that make sense? Okay. I think that was my last slide. Am I correct? All right, cool. So I've got some worksheets for you guys to work on. This is for today and uh, Tuesday. One more slide. Oh, the octet row. Sorry. Thank you. I'll do one more slide then. Oh, yeah. We, we kind of talked a little bit about this then. Typically, things want eight electrons. There are some exceptions, but most things want to have a full valence shell. So if you have seven electrons, like chlorine does, Try to add one more and get up to eight. So normally things try to fill together in groups of eight. Okay. Uh, let's just talk about fluorine here, and then we'll call it the day. Here's fluorine. Is it full in that level there? No, it's got two filled, plus then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So fluorine would like to have one more and have eight and be like you. That make sense? So that's the rule we call it. We call it the octet rule. Okay, now I had, here it is. So I know we only have like five minutes left today. You guys can pack up if you'd like. I don't really care. But my goal then is to give you something to work on if you want to over the weekend. But specifically, this is good studying then on Tuesday for your test on Wednesday. Does that make sense? So on the test on Wednesday, everything we've covered in topics one, two, and three. videos. So the video from yesterday is posted to my website if any of you wanted to watch it, and I'll do the same thing with today's video. So that way you can re-watch anything in case you missed it.